first things that we can do to become culturally competent is to acknowledge one's own culture. And in fact, that's something that probably very few of us have actually ever done. Uh, there's so many different things that contribute to culture, be it language, uh, race, ethnicity, where we come from, even the fact that we practice medicine, that's a little culture of itself. Um, once you know what your culture is and you've defined who you are, that allows you to determine what your golden rule is, so to speak. I'll tell you about my golden rule. Uh, when I was a kid, my mother would uh, try to teach me to be empathetic by saying, well, what would you think if someone did that to you? Right? Treat others like you would want to be treated. So that's a great rule, and it works, though, only so far as you're dealing with people with the same attitudes and values as you. Once you're dealing with people with different values, then you have to go a step further and establish what we call the platinum rule. And that's where you ask yourself not treat others how you would want to be treated, but rather ask others how they want to be treated. And then once you get that, then you're truly a good cross-cultural communicator. I remember this one case um, of an um, elderly lady who came to hospital. She had um, difficulty breathing um, due to uh, malignant effusions. And uh, once the physician determined that she had uh, cancer, she was very good, very gentle, and talked to this, uh, this patient and told her that she had cancer and discussed the options. The patient was very quiet, um, and the physician thought that was probably just due to the shock. And she felt that overall she'd done a good job and was quite empathetic in telling the patient that she had cancer. Well, the next morning when she came back on rounds, the family was there and were very upset. And uh, they told her uh, in no uncertain terms that they felt that she had been heartless and how dare she tell their mother that she had cancer. Uh, now their mother was going to lose the will to live, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the physician defended herself saying, well, this is the way it is. The patient has a right to know what their diagnosis is. They have a right to decide on what treatments they want. What she hadn't considered was that this family came from a culture where there was very little notion of patient confidentiality and patient autonomy. They came from a culture where it was expected and physicians played a role in um, hiding diagnoses uh, from patients, where families would be the ones uh, who would decide, for instance, uh, when, where, even if they were going to tell the patient about their diagnosis. So there was a college complaint with regards to that and the college acknowledged that the physician had acted appropriately in giving information because that's the way we practice in Canada. However, they did caution her to be careful about how she communicates with families and to pay particular attention on those cultural issues that would have uh, strengthened the doctor-patient relationship. There are a number of lessons that we've learned uh, through the years looking at these types of cases. Um, number one is you can't assume to know how a patient is going to want to be treated even though you may think you do. It's always safer to ask people how they want to be treated. The second one is to make sure that we don't actually transfer our own values, our own beliefs into our practice. Um, we have to again keep in mind the fact that not everybody wants to be treated the same way. We have to be aware of the standard of care for practicing in Canada. We can't simply continue to practice the way we've always practiced uh, based on the fact that it's familiar to us. 